this is chapters 56 to 60 of 14 ways to die 56 i can't concentrate mr collins words drifting past in a fog the newspaper article covering the words i should be studying there she is my beautiful mother she smiles up at me reminding me of everything i know and everything i don't this isn't one of the latest stories it's from 10 years ago this is how the world was told she had died I've never seen this clipping before. It's not mine, but it was in my bag, not buried at the bottom, but slipped beside a book I only used three times a week. This morning, the book was on my desk at home. Whoever put the article there, they did it today. Whoever it was goes to St. Anthony's. Fuck, I whisper, and Mr. Collins stopped talking and look at me. Did you say something, Miss Simmons? A couple of people around me giggle until Mr. Collins shuts them down with a stare. No, I say, I'm sorry. He keeps staring for a few more seconds, then turns back to his book. If this was someone else's class, I could excuse myself, but Mr. Collins is an asshole when it comes to things like that. You don't ask to use the bathroom. We learned that the hard way in sixth grade and again last September. Some teachers change when you're in high school and some don't. Mr. Humphrey says Mr. Collins is old school, but that's a polite way of saying he's a dick. I push my fingers to my temples, trying to calm the headache that has come hard and fast. Who did this and why? I look around the classroom and suddenly don't trust anybody. I read the story over and over again, and when class finally ends, I fold it and tuck it in my pocket, my fingers smudged gray. Who keeps a newspaper for 10 years? Why? We keep what we want to remember. We hoard what we can't live without. I feel sick and my head is racing, and when I stand up to leave, I feel dizzy and fall back into my seat. The classroom is empty except for me and Mr. Collins. He starts talking to himself, then notices me and says, Jessica, it's lunchtime. I stare, at him, stare up at him, yet all I can see is my mother's face. I think about going home and not coming back, but I need to show someone, so I head straight to the homeroom where Emily and Hannah are waiting for me. Hey, Emily says, where? But Hannah touches her arm to stop her and says, what is it, Jess? She's getting used to these moments. She knows the look that comes before drama. I pull the clipping from my pocket and hand it to her. Someone put that in my bag today. Emily leans over and Hannah shakes her head and says, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. It wasn't there this morning and now it is. They don't know what to say and I don't blame them. Even Emily is speechless. Hannah says, it has to be the same guy, the one with the brick. He must go here. I shake my head. It was published years ago. Why would someone keep it all this time? Maybe they found it, Emily says. My mom keeps all sorts of crap. Or eBay, Hannah says. You can buy anything online. They're doing it to freak you out. Well, it's working. None of us laugh. We sit in silence, staring at the black and white photo of my mom, the woman neither of my best friends will ever know. 57. I look closely at everyone studying the rest of the school, waiting for a crack to show. I need to stay focused on the magpie man, but I don't know what's real anymore. I don't know what is dangerous and what is harmless. I think of the shape outside my window, the brick in the drawing, the letter left at the front door, and now the article. Is it all the same person? What if it, what is a clue and what is someone messing around? I need to figure out who's playing with me. This is all, this is too much to ignore. Whoever put that article in my bag, I don't think it's him. He wouldn't risk getting caught. He'd be change, he'd be changing the habit of a lifetime. The only people he ever got that close to are dead. I stare across the courtyard at the 6th and 7th graders, turning every moment into a game, laughing their way to class like they don't have a care in the world. That's when I see Jamie, the boy who pulled me back from the alley, and he catches my eye before I can look away and bounds over with the wildest smile. By the time he reaches me, it has changed into an awkward grimace. Hey, he says. Hi. He doesn't say anything else, just stares at me as, as if he expects something until I ask. What are you up to? It's stupid, but it's all I've got. I can talk to Hannah and Emily for hours about nothing, but I can't say a single decent sentence to a boy, even one like Jamie. Well, it's not entirely true. I have to script it first. I'm off to French, Jamie says, and for a split second, it looks like he's going to speak some more. Don't ask me how, but I can actually see the thought cross, it, the thought cross his mind before he shakes his head and looks disappointed with himself. I smile because I like how goofy he is then blush because i barely know him has anything else happened he asks you know like before i touch my bag and almost show jamie the newspaper article before changing my mind i don't know him well enough to be that honest even if he is the only person on my street paying attention no i say it's been quiet 
I feel my tears push on whatever holds them back. Then I shrug and walk away. When I turn, Jamie is still staring at me and I have two thoughts, one after the other. I should have showed him. And what if he did it? Who? 58. It sounds like it's my in my dreams, a faraway scratching that grows louder until I realize I'm awake. I hold my breath and focus on the noise, convince someone it is someone is in my room rustling in the shadows. But it's not that close. It's near, but somehow distant at the same time. And when I concentrate, I hear a tap against my window, then something slowly scraping along the glass. I clench my fist, my heart racing, then I slip out of bed and creep to my desk, feeling for the head cam in the dark. The noise stops for a moment, then starts again, a thud followed by a scrape, like fists and fingernails. I have practiced how to use the camera so many times, but my hands won't do what I want them to do. They're shaking and sweating and useless. Come on, I whisper. You can do this. The record light flashes on, my room glowing red, and I stand by my window, daring myself to pull back the curtain. I follow the noise scraping from left to right, and I don't want to see what's there. If it's really him, what does he want from me? My breathing fills the room, frantic and jagged, and my nails have cut tiny half moons into my palms. But it's now or never, so I grip the curtain, focus on my mother, and pull. Something slips below the window, and when I look down, he's standing by our front door. He has a long branch in his hand, and seeing his shape in the darkness, my heart finds another gear pulsing through my skull. He drops the branch and steps back, holding one arm to his face and turning the other around and around like he's playing charades like he wants me to film him. Who are you? I whisper, holding the camera up. This is not going out live. Whatever I film, Danny will edit it and put it out as additional highlights. He stands there staring up at me, every part of him covered except his eyes, and I slowly reach for my phone, ready to dial 999. That's why I notice his shape behind him, slowly moving forward, getting closer step by careful step. It's Jamie, and he has a hammer in his hand. What are you doing? I whisper. He's going to get hurt and I can't handle this. I feel sick and helpless, and before I can do anything, he swings and smashes the man on the shoulder. The man yells and turns, and Jamie swings again, hitting the man in the chest, and he stumbles back, looking both ways, and starts running. Jamie pauses for a moment, as if he's realized how stupid he's been. Then he runs after the man, and I pull on a hoodie and my shoes and follow them, because sometimes I can be just as stupid. I see them down the street, and Jamie tackles the man from behind, pulling him to the ground. He's holding the hammer above his head, saying something I can't hear while I run toward them, yelling Jamie's name. He stares up at me and looks both happy and confused at the same time. I caught him, he says. The man still has his face covered, but you can tell from his eyes that he's shitting himself. <laughs> Jamie looks down and says, you are sick, you know that? Then he pulls off the man's hood and his hat and the scarf covering the bottom half of his face, and I can't believe my eyes. What the fuck, I say? The man And the man who smashed my window, the man standing in the shadow in the middle of my street, says, I'm sorry, Jessica, you were never supposed to find out. Chapter 59. Michael, the cameraman, the man I let into my bedroom every Monday morning, lies there staring up at us and says, could you lower the hammer? Jessica looks at me. Jamie looks at me, and for a second, I imagine what would happen if he hit Michael in the face. But I reach out and touch his arm until it falls to his side, the hammer clanking on the pavement. It's okay, I say. I know him. Jamie stares at me for, with his mouth open, and I shake my head, unsure what to do next. Whose idea was it, I say at last. Michael doesn't answer. He stares at me in panic, his head turning left and right, like he's looking for a way out. Whose idea was it, I say, louder this time, and Michael's eyes shoot back to me. It was mine, he whispers. Does Danny know? I don't think I want to hear the answer, but when Michael says no, I feel a wave of relief. He has no idea, Michael says. I'm sorry, Jess. If this gets out, I'm fucked. Then you're fucked, Jamie says. He looks hyper, bouncing from one foot to the other, but I turn back to Michael and ask, why? I wanted the three months, he says. We needed some peril. So you made it up? It was you all along? I'm sorry. His face cracks, and for a moment I think he's going to cry, but he shakes his head and whispers, our month is almost up. I wanted to make sure you got more time. I wanted the best possible show. And when the real magpie man didn't come, I thought I'd make it, it exciting. Did you send the text? He nods. What's wrong with you? You scared the shit out of me. This isn't a game. It's my life. He opens his mouth to answer, then stops. He sits with his head down. I wasn't even live today. Why bother when no one's watching? Authenticity, Michael says. It should have been... It would have been too obvious if I had only done it on Mondays. 
Someone would have thought we were faking it. I was relying on you filming. You're getting good at it. I stared at the sky and wondered what the hell to do next. My own cameraman betrayed me. We tried to make something real and it was as fake as everything else. What now? Jamie says, then turns to Michael. Don't even think about pressing charges for the hammer thing. I thought you were a murderer. Michael stares at me and says, what are you going to do? I think about his baby daughter and wonder how he could do this, how he could scare me, how he could get my hopes up that I was really closing in on a monster. If this gets out that my cameraman fixed entire scenes, the show is over. No one will trust me anymore. You owe my dad for the window, I say, and then I grab Jamie's arm and pull him away. That's it? Jamie asks. That's it. I need to get away from here. I have to think. What about him? I look at Michael slowly getting to his feet and say, where did you get the article? What? The story about my mom that you put in my bag, where did you get it? I don't know what you're talking about. He looks genuinely confused, but then he is a good actor. You're lying, I say. He shakes his head. I promise you, Jessica, I sent the text and I threw the brick, but that's all. 60. I phone Danny as soon as I wake up and he mutters something into the phone, clears his throat and tries again. Hey, I say, I need to see you. Are you okay? Did something happen? Yes. Are you free today? Are you free today? Don't you have school? This is more important than school, I tell him, and he agrees to come right away. When I get in his car, I hand him the camera. Your friend is a freak. What? I lean over and push play, and Danny watches Jamie creep up on Michael, chase him down the street, and unmask him. What the hell? Danny says as I search for the slightest suggestion that he's pretending. He looks even more shocked than I was when I found out. Michael told me everything. He planned to get, planned it to get better ratings. Danny goes quiet for a while, then says, Jess, I had no idea. I don't answer. Just stare at him until he asks, What do you want to do? What? It's your show. I'd understand if you don't trust us anymore. No, I, I still trust you. We can get another cameraman, Danny says. I laugh. What's the point? It'll be over in a week. I actually thought it might have been him. How could I have... How could I be so stupid? You're not stupid, Dan Danny says. How about just you and me? We can film everything between us. What about Michael? One word to Adrian and he'll be fired. It's hard to be angry with Danny, but that doesn't mean I'm not. I know it's foolish to think the magpie man was texting me, taunting me, standing outside my window, but now I don't have anything, not even the uncertainty. I almost tell Danny about the newspaper article because Michael seemed genuinely clueless when I mentioned it. But if it turns out to be as harmless as everything else, that's a thought too far. I'll see you when you're back from your retreat, Danny says. It won't be your last show. I believe in you. He can believe all he wants, but I have been chasing the wrong shadows and messages and messaging the wrong monster. Even if I get the extension, I'm back to square one.